Okay, and then I'm going to also put you on speaker view, Mike, so that you are the sole focus right here of this meeting. Okay, there you go. You're all set, Mike. Okay, thank you. Well, it's good to be with you again. I want to begin by asking you to turn with me. I'm going to do three short readings uh, this evening, uh, but you'll begin to see uh, where we're headed with all this. But I want to begin in Psalm 11 and verse 3. Psalm 11 and verse 3. And it simply states this, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I think we can see very clearly in our present world, the foundations of civilization as we know it are being continually eroded. Uh, we're seeing, as it were, an implosion, really. The family's breaking down, uh, law and order is breaking down. Uh, the foundations are being destroyed. Then I want you to look with me, please, uh, to the book of Genesis and chapter one. And I believe that part of the reason the foundations have been destroyed is because there has been an unmitigated assault on the teaching of the book of Genesis. I think the enemy recognizes if I can undermine people's confidence in Genesis, <laughs> then they'll not believe the rest of the Bible either. The whole thing will come down like a pack of cards. And so we want to just read uh, just one verse, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then one final reading, please, from the book of Exodus and Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10 and 11. And we're going to have a lot more to say than just reading these three verses. And we'll look at quite a number of scriptures. But I just want to, as it were, in an opening as it were, salvo of scriptures, read these particular verses. And that's Exodus 20 and verses 10 and 11. In fact, uh, maybe we'll begin in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. And here's the key verse I want you to notice. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And all I want to say at this simple stage is that I really believe what the word of God says about the book of Genesis. And I believe the commentary in Exodus would tell us that the days in Genesis weren't ages. They weren't long geological ages. They were 24 hour days. In fact, the Lord says the evening and the morning were the first day. And even the gap theory, and maybe some of you hold to this theory. I have to say, I believe that it's a theology of accommodation. It's a theology that is saying, I want to, I accept what science falsely so-called uh, has uh, said, uh, and I want the Bible to fit with seemingly science. So I'm going to accommodate that. In fact, that gap theory goes back to a man called Thomas Chalmers, who taught in a university in Scotland, and godly man, the Lord used him in many, many ways. But, but again, it just seemed in those days that the evidence for evolution seemed to be pretty compelling. That's because they didn't have answers in Genesis in those days. That's because they didn't have ICR and Henry Morris and all these other things. And, and it was all new. And so, so they tried to somehow keep the Bible relevant by making it fit. Uh, I'm afraid, sadly, it doesn't fit. And the reason it doesn't fit is this, because the scripture says, by one man, Sin, death came into sin came into the world, and death by sin. And so, if you have all these dead things in these layers, and they occurred before the creation of Adam, which is what the gap theory says, then again, Gen uh, Romans is wrong, because it says by one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. You didn't have any death prior to Adam. So I just want to say this: that if we want to establish the foundations again. We have to go to the place where the foundations have been eroded. And where they've been eroded is the book of Genesis. That's what the enemy has sought to do. Knock down Genesis and the whole superstructure falls down. Now, I remember one time going to look at a house in Ireland 
Uh, we were looking for a bigger house, fit my library and my growing family. And uh, of course, we found this house and the price was amazing. Was looking. And, and uh, as we as we got to this house, um, the, the problem with it was it had bad foundations. And it was a beautiful looking house, but the whole thing was sinking into the mud. It had poor foundations. And so we have to have right foundations. And so I really believe the book of Genesis is foundational. So what I want to do uh, just in this time we have together is I want to just kind of talk about the book of Genesis. Now, as we talk about the book of Genesis, um, part of the reason I decided to do this, not just because I'm concerned about the foundations being eroded, and I am, and prominent speakers, some of them, Assembly speakers, I believe, are compromising on Genesis. I have to say this, and it bothers me immensely. Uh, I really believe we have to stay close to the Word of God. We better not try and accommodate these things. Secondly, uh, the reason is because hopefully at the beginning of your year, you're reading through the Bible every year. I kind of happen to fall in with a group of Christians who they read through the Bible every year. And so they were the only Christians I knew. And so I assumed, well, that's what Christians did. And so ever since I got saved, I read through the Bible every year. Oh, what a blessing it was to fall in with Christians like that. And so if you're doing that, and if not, I want to challenge you, right? Still time. Genesis, uh, what, we are, what we are today, uh, 7th of January. If you haven't started your re reading plan, you can still do it. There's still time. It won't take you long to catch up seven days. And so I want to encourage you to do that. But I want to just help you because as you're going to read through Genesis, I want to give you some, some good clues of what to look for, kind of a little bit of an overview of the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis divides into two distinct sections. Chapters 1 through 11 deals with the universal history of the world prior to the call of Abraham. Our assembly, we just started a, a new conversational Bible reading on Wednesday night, and we're going through Genesis 1 through 11. Boy, am I excited. I'm so excited about this, looking forward to it. But we're just dealing with 1 through 11. We want to look at world history uh, up to the call of Abraham in chapter 12, the first 11 chapters. And so that's what that deals with. Chapter 12 onwards deals with primarily with the nation of Israel. God only mentions other nations from Genesis 12 onwards, as they interact with God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. And so that's a very important thing to keep in mind as you read chapters 12 through 50 of the book of Genesis. I want to say this, that the first 11 chapters is the only authentic history of the, the, the world that really explains why we are like we are today. It explains to us why man is so sinful. Why is man so rebellious? Why is the world like it is? Why are there thorns and thistles? Why why have we uh, all this uh, kind of uh, weather disturbances? Why is the world in convulsion? Why is creation groaning like it is? Well, these first 11 chapters is the only true explanation of why we are the way we are. It's so, so important. It's also hotly contested. Uh, I would say the first 11 chapters is the most hotly contested material in the whole Bible. I want to think a little bit about the authorship of Genesis. We know that it's part of what we call the Pentateuch. Pentateuch coming from the idea of number five. And there are five, the first five books, the five books of Moses that we consider. And so it's generally accepted that Moses at least was the person that put this library together. And uh, the difficulty with Genesis, it's not, it's not a problem with Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we can see because Moses is kind of a main player in all of that. But when we look at Genesis, some of it goes back 2,500 years before his birth. So how could he possibly know all this stuff, see? So that's the big question. And so the difficulty of, of answering that is how could Moses write this when it, it deals with events that occurred 2,500 years uh, at the most before he was born? Well, we'd say three suggestions I want to give you this evening. One is uh, it was given by direct, direct dictation. 
uh, dreams and revelations from God. That's one view that is being suggested. I don't buy that particularly myself, but I've heard people say that. Second view is oral traditions passed down from father to son. And when Moses got these things as he's wandering through the wilderness, uh, while he's in his tent at night, he's compiling these stories into what we call the book of Genesis. Another view, which I think is the most accurate one, is that there were actual written records collected together by each individual in the book of Genesis. And it's kind of interesting when you look at Genesis, um, you, you have kind of sections that are marked off very clearly. I want to give you an example. And it usually, how we know a section is marked off is it usually has, these are the generations of. So for instance, chapter two, verse four, these are the generations of the heaven and of the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And so basically that's a summary of the, the creation story. Uh, and so the next one, Genesis 5 and verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of him. So again, we've got this is kind of Adam's story that is being put together here. Chapter 6, verse 9. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Okay, so this is Noah's little contribution. This is his story is beginning here, Genesis 6, 9, Genesis 10 and verse 1. And again, we'll see these little sections. Uh, it says, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and they, they, them that were born uh, uh, <clears throat> after the flood. So again, it's carrying on the story. But again, it's another section that I believe these people carefully compiled. And by the way, I've got to say that, these people were not Neanderthal men. They were highly intelligent. If Adam could name all the animals and give them original names, just think how much problem we have naming a baby. Who comes up with an original name for a baby? We usually name it with somebody else's name, don't we? Somebody else has given that name. Listen, Adam was an incredibly intelligent man. And I believe that he could write and record his uh, generations quite clearly. And so uh, we, we could go on. Uh, we'll make maybe look at another one, chapter 11, verse 27. It goes all the way through the book. You can see these things so clearly. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, Haran, so on and so forth. And so, of course, we're getting into Abraham's household, Abraham's family. Uh, and it goes all the way through chapter 25. There's one. Chapter 36, these are the generations of. So basically, each of these individuals wrote their story down. Moses came, and of course, he makes some editorial comments as well, but he collects them together and puts them together. And of course, he's guided by the Holy Spirit as he's doing all this. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so they put together what we consider to be the book of Genesis. And of course, um, Moses collected them together, edited them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just say this. I want to talk about Genesis in the New Testament just for a second. Genesis is quoted directly over 200 times in the New Testament, and always, by the way, as historical fact. Never mentioned that this is some kind of myth or mythology. In fact, C.S. Lewis, very interesting. C.S. Lewis, he, because uh, his whole career was based on studying mythology in literature. And when he was converted and he read the Bible and he read through Genesis, his first comment was, I'm a man who knows mythology. He said, Genesis 1 is not mythology. It is history. Interesting. I think that's not because C.S. Lewis says it, but I think it's helpful to think about these things. So clearly, quoted 200 times in the New Testament, foundational to the New Testament, absolutely foundational. When the Lord Jesus was being questioned on the issue of divorce and remarriage, what does he do? He goes, in the beginning, it was not so. God made them male and female. By the way, there was no gender issues back then either. God made them male and female. No in-betweens, no, no confusion, no gender confusion. Again, you see what I'm saying? When the foundations are destroyed, what are the righteous going to do? We have to go back to Genesis. It's clear. It's Everything is, is just orderly. Uh, it, it, it's, it's what's happened since. It's the undermining of these principles that's caused all the chaos and confusion 
in our education system is because we've rejected a literal reading of Genesis that we're in the mess we're in. Of course, it's the book of origins and beginnings. If you like studying the principle of first mention, you'll spend a lot of time in the book of Genesis. First mention of many, many things. We'll just talk about different things. The origins. It's, 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 uh, the Bible is incomprehensible without Genesis. Understanding our world is incomprehensible without Genesis. It explains the origin of our universe, space, time, and matter. It explains the origin of order and complexity, what we call the laws of thermodynamics. It, it deals with the origin of the solar system, the origin of the atmosphere and hydrospace, the origin of life, origin of man, origin of marriage, origin of evil, origin of languages, origin of government, origin of nations, origin of religion back in Genesis chapter 4. Cain's religion that he introduces, the origin of the chosen people in Genesis chapter 12. So it really is a book of the beginning of everything except God. Hope you caught what I just said there. It's the beginning of everything except God, because in the beginning, God He's already there in the beginning, already existing, pre-existent, always existed, the eternal God, and he is the one that creates space, time, and matter. Now, what I'd like to do now is just look at Genesis, perhaps from a different perspective. I want to think about the book of Genesis as the history of eight men. Yes, it's the history of the world, but it's also the history of eight men. Four of them are before the pre-flood world. Now, of course, there are other men mentioned. I realize that. But but these are the primary men. So when you think before the flood, the key men are Adam, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Yeah, there are other men that interact with them, but these are the main players. Four men prior to the flood, Genesis 1 through 11. Post-flood, another four men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, chapters 12 through 50. So the book of Genesis is really the history of eight men. What is so interesting, at least to me, is it seems that they form an inverted parallelism. I'm not going to get too complicated here, but in Hebrew writing, they love parallelism, kind of putting ideas together in parallel. You see it a lot in Hebrew writing. And so when we look at these eight men, there's a parallel between the first man and the eighth man. Okay? There's a parallel, a clear link, between the second man and the seventh man, between the third man and the sixth man, and between the fourth man and the fifth man. Now, I'm going to make it easy for you, because as we look at each one, I'm going to say, okay, this is the first man, this is the eighth man, and you'll be able to see these parallels. So we're just going to go through and see this, because... And you say, well, so what? What What's the big deal about all this? Mike, why are you even wasting our time talking about this? Well, let me tell you why. I want to show you tonight that no human being could write a book like this. That there, there are just, there's just an order to the word of God. And there's a, there's a complexity and yet a simplicity to the word of God that only God could produce. And so it's just marvelous when I look at these things and I discover these things. And by the way, uh, I have to just say, I, I'm a gleaner. I didn't think this up. If you think that oh, Mike Atwood came up with these 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 eight men and their, their parallelisms, um, I, I actually was looking in my notes, uh, getting ready for our Bible reading, and I came came up with my notes, and I had these things in my notes, and I have no idea where I got them from. But I can assure you, I'm not smart enough to think this up myself. I got it from gleaning. And by the way, if anybody thinks that you have an original thought, uh, I suspect that not really. You probably got it somewhere from gleaning from others. We're all indebted to other people. And we thank God for those that have studied these things and come up with them. So anyway, just in case you think that I'm the smart guy that came up with this, I just want to assure you that I'm not. But so as we think of, first of all, the first and the eighth man. First man is Adam. The eighth man is Joseph. Okay? The last one in Genesis, the first one in Genesis. So let's just think about these things. In what ways do these men parallel each other? Well, one of them was given rule 
over Eden. That was Adam, right? God gave him dominion, right? And Eden was his domain. <laughs> and then there's this fellow called Joseph, and he's given dominion over Egypt. Isn't that interesting? He's ruling over it, uh, as it were, as uh, under, of course, under Pharaoh, just as Adam is ruling under God, but both are given dominion. One of them was cast out by God, as, of course, we know Adam, and where I'm assuming you've got a good but not knowledge of, of Genesis, and if you don't, then I'm hoping you're going to read it after this message, okay? So, one way or another. And so, one was cast out by God. The other had the experience of being cast out by his brethren. You remember that? Joseph's brethren hated him, and they wanted to get rid of him, and they cast him out, didn't they? Am I making this up, or is this really true? You know this is true, right? He was ca cast out. Uh, and so, both of them had two sons. In, in both cases, the blessing went to the younger. Abel was the one who was the blessed one of God, and so was Ephraim over his brother Manasseh. Abel over Cain, Ephraim over Manasseh. Each of these men, Adam and Joseph, were given a wife. Right? God brought to... <laughs> Adam, a wife. He also, because uh, took him took her out of his rib, and also we find that um, in the case of Joseph, Pharaoh gave him uh, a wife, and, and so both are given a wife. And actually, not only were both given a wife, both of their wives are types of the church. Isn't that interesting? Because Joseph's wife was a Gentile bride given to him. And so, again, a type of the church. Eve was a type of the church. And so it's just kind of interesting that this parallelism, parallelism seems to fit. Each of them had a coat made for him. Adam had a coat of skins made for him that covered up his nakedness and shame. Joseph had a coat of many colors made to him from his father, Jacob. So both of them have coats made for them. Both of them, the way they dealt with, dealt with their death or how their death was mentioned is very interesting. To Adam, God said, from dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. Joseph, when he thinks about his death, he says, don't forget my bones. Kind of a strange way to think about, right? And, and whatever you do, when you go back to the land, take my bones with you. Just kind of interesting little par parallels. Both recognizing the dust principle, basically, that there's going to be this going back to dust in a sense. But here's the most striking contrast or comparison between the two. Both of them were tempted by a woman. Eve tempted Adam to do something that he knew he should not do, eat the fruit from the tree of the Garden of Eden. And what did Adam do? He ate it. Joseph was tempted by a woman. I, I, I tell you, I admire Joseph. I mean, a, a young man with all the necessary horm hormones of a young man and no doubt a beautiful woman every single day saying to him, lay with me. And he said, I'm not going to do this great sin against God. Wow, tremendous, isn't it? And so you see uh, kind of, a, and do you not, do you not see in Joseph, I mean, I know that the scholars tell us Joseph is not really a type of Christ because they say it's never mentioned in the New Testament. Well, I'm glad I'm not a scholar because I can't read the story of Joseph without seeing a picture of Christ. Because, you see, the first Adam was tempted, wasn't he, and failed in a perfect God. And the second Adam, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, was also tempted, but he did not succeed or succumb. And, oh, how we see a con contrast between the two. It's wonderful to see these things. And so I think we can see that at least when we look at the first man and the eighth man, I hope we can see that there's a little bit of parallelism there. 
okay, what about the second and the seventh man? Is this going to work all the way through? Well, I think you'll find it does. So now the second is Abel, and the seventh is Jacob. And what we find about these two individuals is they're both worshippers. Abel offered to God that acceptable sacrifice, didn't he? Uh, he, he? He brought uh, at, at, the, at the right moment this 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 sacrifice that was was offered and accepted and and God accepted that and Jacob what do we learn of Jacob it, it says this Jacob worshiped leaning on his staff the second man and the seventh man uh, worshipers by the way, I hope you're a worshiper. I hope that you enjoyed worshiping this morning. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to be a worshiper of the by bringing to him that which he delights in. And of course, nothing he delights in more than his lovely son, the Lord Jesus, of whom Abel's lamb spoke of. Oh, yes. What a wonderful thing to be a, a worshiper. Now, again, as we con consider Abel and, and Jacob, th this is where kind of interesting the contrast. One of them has a very short life. The other one has a very long life uh, as we compare the two. Abel was persecuted by his brother Cain. Jacob fled because his, his brother Esau threatened to kill him. So again, do we see a little bit of parallelism here? I, I think we can see it. Abel gave his gifts to God, as we see recorded in Hebrews 11, verse 4. But Jacob also, in Genesis 28, promised gifts to the Lord. He said, everything that I, I get from now on, I'm going to give a tenth to you. And so both of them brought gifts to the Lord. So at least I think we can see that the second and the seventh man have some things that bring them together in common. What about the third and the sixth man? So now we're talking about Enoch and Isaac. Because number seven is associated with both men. Enoch, we're told, is the seventh from Adam. Jude 14 tells us that. And Isaac is the 21st from Adam. So they're both connected with the number seven. In both cases, their fathers were old men. Remember Enoch's father? That was Methuselah. He was a really old man, wasn't he? 969 years of age. And what about Isaac's father? Well, it's Abraham. And he conceived when he was past conceiving children, right? It was, it was a miracle child. And so again, both of them had old fathers. Enoch escaped the flood by being raptured before it came. Isaac escaped the knife by a substitute being found to take his place. Do you remember Genesis 22, that ram that was found in the thicket? And so in one sense, Isaac points to Christ's first advent, you know, Christ is the, the, the sinner's substitute. Uh, a substitute was found for him. And so we, it, his story points to Christ at his first advent. advent. Enoch points to Christ at the second advent, the Lord returning to snatch away his bride prior to judgment falling. And so I think we can see for sure Enoch and Isaac kind of fit together in this in this parallelism that God has constructed in the book of Genesis. Now, what about Noah and Abraham, fourth and fifth? Both men are tenth generations. Noah's the tenth from Adam. Abraham's the twentieth from Adam. Ten is the number of responsibility, of human responsibility. Remember, there are ten commandments. Remember the 10 spies, usually it's human failure as well, because uh, when man's given responsibility, usually he doesn't do very well with it. <clears throat> there are 10 servants in Luke's gospel, chapter 19, that are left behind after the Lord goes uh, uh, to the far country. And so it speaks of being given great responsibility. And both Noah and Abraham were given huge responsibility, weren't they? Abraham... Well, his responsibility was to produce a nation. I'm going to make of you a great 
nation. <laughs> and then what about our friend Noah? His responsibility was to produce an ark. <laughs> that was a project. If you've ever been to the ark encounter, I think you probably have, you'll realize what a project, what a responsibility was given to Noah. Both men were given responsibilities. One produces an ark, the other produces a nation. Noah is the last of the first four representative men before the flood. And Abraham is the first of the four representative men after the flood. Both men were called of God and separated. The first one, Noah, he was separated from the old world by water. <laughs> He was, he was a separated in his generation too, wasn't he? That whole generation was corrupt, and yet he was a separated man. Uh, he was the only one that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He, and, and so he was very much a separated man, but he was separated as well uh, by the waters of the flood from the old world. And so he was a man who was separated. The second, that's Abraham, was also separated. When he saw a glimpse of the glory of God, God says, get out from your kindred, from your country, <laughs> and go to a place that I'm going to show you. He's completely separated from that. He has to leave that behind. When we think of these two men, Noah was moved by fear. That's what scripture says. He was moved by fear building the ark. Abraham was motivated by the glory of God. It's interesting because Stephen, as he comments on the story of Abraham, he says this, the God of glory appeared to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees. And of course, when, when he saw the glory of God, suddenly the idols that Ur of the Chaldees was filled with looked really tacky compared to the glory of God. And he left it all behind, turned his back on Ur of the Chaldees, and he went out to a place not knowing where he was going. But again, it was motivated by the glory of God. You know, today, when people get saved, it's either like Saul of Tarsus, who was saved when he saw the glory of Christ. Do you remember on the Damascus Road, he saw the glory that was greater than the sun at midday? Or like the Philippian jailer, who I just preached on this morning, who was saved by fear. People are saved by getting a glimpse of the glory of Christ, or they're saved by fear. God saves them either way. Thank God, whatever way you got saved, whether it's his glory or his fear that caused you to get saved, praise God that you saw one or the other. <laughs> and But these men were motivated by these things. These are great motivators. Only these two men did God enter into a covenant with in Genesis. Noah's covenant right was concerning the earth and its fruitfulness but he entered into a covenant with noah the noah what we call the noahic covenant and then we also have another covenant that god enters into with abraham concerning the land of canaan to be the possession through the promised seed both of these men were given a sign or a symbol of the covenant which god made with them when it comes to noah the covenant sign for Noah was the rainbow, wasn't it? He set his bow in the clouds. That's an evidence of, I'm not going to flood the world again. I have purposes for this world. You need to replenish it, all the rest of it. Noah's covenant, there's a sign connected with it. It's a bow in the sky. What about Abraham? Is there a sign connected with his covenant? Well, yes, there is. The covenant of circumcision, the circumcision of the body. Both these great men, by the way, who had tremendous responsibilities given to them, both had severe lapses in their faith walk with the Lord. Noah, talk about first, he's the first drunk recorded in Scripture. Isn't that interesting? By the way, I, I find it interesting today that social drinking is becoming very acceptable amongst Christians. What I'd like to say to them is this. If you think you're a better man than Noah, you go ahead. But Noah couldn't handle his liquor. 
and he ended up naked in the tent. If that ought not to be a warning to us, and if that's not enough, then just slip down to chapter 19 of Genesis and Lot and what happens to him when he's drunk. Well, let me tell you, drunkenness is a very serious thing. And the safest and easiest way I've found not to get drunk is not to drink. <laughs> it's not rocket science, but I never have a problem with drunkenness because I never drink the stuff. Why would I want to? Wine is symbolic of joy. And I've got all the joy I need in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The, 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 the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Oh, it's so much better than the, 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 the joy that wine can give because the wine joy sometimes ends up with a hangover. I've never been hung over from worshiping the Lord. Oh, what joy there is in serving him. And so again, we just want to second, recognize this. Both men had lapses. Noah, drunken stupor, Abraham went down to Egypt. Yeah, there were awful consequences to Abraham going down to Egypt, weren't they? Felt to this very hour. Isn't it amazing? The awesome consequences of choices that we make. Who would think that the headlines in today's world go back to a lapse in Abraham's judgment when he goes down into Egypt? See, he picked up somebody there, didn't he? He picked up a maid. And later on, he listens to his wife. Sometimes it's good to listen to your wife, and sometimes it's not so good, depending on what advice she gives. And of course, Sarah advised him to take his maid. And out of that came Ishmael. And out of Ishmael came the Arab nations and the Arab-Israeli conflict that we're watching to this very hour in the media goes back to that lapse in Egypt. By the way, there's a warning to us. You see, there are a lot of great heroes. These eight men, in many ways, they're heroes to us. And these men find their way into most of them in Hebrews 11. They're part of the heroes of the faith. But folks, let me just tell you, the best of men are men at best. And all of them, <laughs> well, they had their moments. There's only one perfect man that ever walked this earth. And that's the Lord Jesus. And so that's why Paul could say this, follow me. And then he says this, I like this qualifier, as I follow Christ. If you see anything in my life that's not lined up with him, don't pull the trigger. <laughs> you make sure that it's, your life is lined up with his life. Follow me as I follow Christ. In 1 Peter 3, both men are mentioned. Remember, in 1 Peter 3, we've got Sarah and how Sarah is... Uh, well, she called Abraham Lord. And then First Peter 3 ends up with the story of Noah in the flood. <laughs> and uh, again, just how uh, Noah, uh, kind of the whole ark thing and the picture of baptism and passing from the old world into the new world. So you might think to yourself as we've gone through these little comparisons, so what's the whole point? Well, I've said, well, first of all, no book compares with this book. It has the stamp of God upon it. No book can ever come up. I mean, we could spend the rest of our lives studying the Bible. And maybe you've read through Genesis. Maybe all of everything I've said to you today, you've heard before. But maybe you haven't. But one thing I can tell you, we're just waiting in the shallows. The depths of this book is incredible. You'll spend the rest of your life studying it, and you'll still be waiting in the shallows but it's wonderful. It's orderly. It's, it's got the stamp of God about it. Secondly, it's foundational. This, we see the events. We've already said just, just this last comment we've been making about Abraham's failure by going into Egypt in a time of famine and how the echoes of that are being felt to this very hour. The echoes of Eden I heard a guy preach one time and he was he was just showing things in our world and how it all comes out of Edom and the fall. And he kept using that phrase, the echoes of Eden. And that phrase has echoed in my mind ever since, the echoes of Eden. Our broken world is a big echo of Eden. Oh, aren't we glad that in Eden too, there's already a foreshadowing of the work that the Savior would do. 
when Abraham or when Adam was there in his nakedness and shame. And he tries to cover himself with fig leaves, the fruit of a cursed earth. God doesn't accept that. No, there has to be death in the shedding of blood. The wages of sin is death. And so in order to clothe his nakedness and shame, the first physical death occurs in Scripture. There's already been a spiritual death. That's Adam. His relationship with God has been affected. He used to walk with God in the, in the garden in the cool of the day, and now he's hiding from God. There's a, there's a breakdown in that relationship. There's spiritual death has occurred. But now, as God comes to Adam, he now kills an animal and clothes Adam and Eve with animal skins. And what a picture that is, that the only solution to this sin problem that is being brought into this world is through the death of an innocent substitute and through the clothing of the sinner with that clothing that comes from the one that died and shed his precious blood. And by the way, here we stand tonight and we can say we're clothed in the righteousness that is bestowed upon us because of the work of Christ on Calvary when he shed his precious blood. And oh, what a wonderful thing it is. We're now able to enjoy communion with God once again, like Adam once did in the garden, but even more so because we're there as redeemed sinners, just enjoying the wonders of Christ's redemptive work. Oh, all these things are echoes of Eden. Well, I want to encourage you, study Genesis and just take it at face value. Believe it. It's the best way to explain our world as it is today. You want to understand what's going on on the news? Read Genesis and it will give you the foundation. As a church, we need to once again reestablish this foundation. We believe that God created the world in six literal 24-hour days, and on the seventh day, he rested from all his labors. And that's why we had the Sabbath principle, one day in seven, because God rested on the seventh day, evening and the morning were the first day. May God encourage us, help us, thrill our souls, I hope, with this amazing book called Genesis, the book of beginnings. Amen. Okay, Mike, why don't you close in prayer and then we'll have a few other things. Mm -hmm. Father, we just bow in thy presence. We marvel at the scriptures. And yet, Father, we don't want to be like the Pharisees. They love the scriptures. They search the scriptures, but they miss the Savior. Oh, Father, what poverty it would be to be a, a Bible scholar who missed the Savior. Oh, Father, as we look into the Bible, as we read through the text of scripture, Show us beautiful pictures of your son, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, the things in them that speak to us of the Lord Jesus. Oh, Father, we're thankful for the word of God, that we can trust it, that it is inspired, that it is infallible, that although it's not a science book, it's right about science. And sometimes it takes our scientists a little bit of time to catch up. But we know that your word is true from the very beginning. And believe it, every word, with all of our hearts. We thank thee for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.